to get on with it by themselves because unlike Tunisia and Egypt in Libya we have this mad despot spinning out of control who've decided to wage a total war against his own people and kill as many as possible in the last uh, nearly six weeks he has killed over 10,000 so there is a moral and a legal duty and responsibility by the international community to intervene and protect the Libyan population otherwise there will be a huge massacre in Africa another possibly another Rwanda in North Africa. So there, there the community can just watch uh, uh, and sit by. That is, that, is, that is as far as the Libyan situation is concerned. May I just also go back to something that has been said by um, some, uh, your guest from Washington, which is really uh, uh, indicative of uh, how, some, how some people are totally detached and, 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 and even uh, uh, ignorant about what's going on in the Middle East when they attribute everything that has been happening to a conspiracy theory, to a CIA plot. This is really insulting and demeaning to the young Arab populations across the whole of the Middle East. Nearly 75% of the Arab populations are under the age of 30. Let me give you another statistic. In Tunisia, the number of young Tunisians who are on Facebook per capita is higher than that of Germany. The young Arab populations are vibrant, they are educated, they are on Twitter, they are on Facebook, they are on the internet. They have the same aspirations like any other young pe person are across the globe. They want to be free, they want to live in justice, they want to fulfill their potential and express themselves politically, economically, culturally and everything. So they have the same aspirations for democracy and justice like everybody else. And to suggest that somehow the Arab people are inept, are incapable of achieving democracy as if they lack this democracy, democracy right. gene is really insulting. Now, this is typical of some Western commentators who are, are totally detached from this world. Let's get uh, Webster's uh, reaction to this. Go at Washington. Suppose you have a color revolution in Syria. We heard the word dignity before. Uh, in Syria, we have Dignity Day, Dignity Square, the Dignity Movement. Where does that slogan come from? Dignity is the main slogan of Zbigniew Brzezinski in his book about what has to happen with the youth bulge. And what I'm stressing is that that dignity doesn't have much role for trade union rights, for economic development, for kicking out the International Monetary Fund, for declaring a debt moratorium, for, uh, for maintaining a state sector. The, the, the uh, giveaway on a lot of this stuff is that the economic demands are so vague and we're left with these rather generic demands about, about human rights. Uh, concerning uh, whether this is demeaning, I think you have to look at it quite realistically. We had a lot of young people in the United States who were completely duped by Obama in 2008. There's, that's just uh, the way it works, uh, conspiracy theory. Let's look at the, uh, the leadership of those Libyan uh, rebels. Let's look at the people who are running the city of Darna right now. We have two people who are essentially connected or members of al-Qaeda, they're from the Libyan Islamic fighting group, two of them were prisoners of war of the U.S., one in Guantanamo and one in, uh, in Pakistan where he was a fighter. Now, these people were delivered back into the field to do operations against Gaddafi, and I'm talking about Mr. Hasidi and Mr. Kumi. Uh, the Al-Qaeda component of the Libyan rebels, I think, is, is a very big story. I don't share a lot of the U.S. government mythology about Al-Qaeda, but I think it is very unwise to put such people in command of a city. Look at that Darna city council and tell me what the story is. I would say the challenge to people in the Middle East is, you got rid of Mubarak, okay. But now, if that was the February revolution, where's, where's the October revolution? Where's something that actually is going to change something, not just go from the dic dictatorship of Mubarak to the dictatorship of Tantau? All right, but now. But go to some situation now, Mr. where you, Mr. Tarpley, you get now, an economic program. We, we have five minutes left at the end of the first half. So I want to go to Hilal Hashan in Beirut. Hilal, still talking whether it's spontaneous from outside, whatever. Of course, we have foreign forces simply busy as we speak, bombing positions in Libya. But now the question is, what's in it for who? What, what are the stakes and for who? Now, we, we are witness to a United States to simply saying, all right, I'm going into the background, I'm taking my planes out, whatever. Simply, uh, we have NATO members, a divisive NATO simply. We have Europeans at one another's throat with simply... Well, Italians saying we get the refugees, the French get the oil, so on and so forth. And we have a spontaneous, spontaneous movements on the ground. So what are the stakes and what's in it for who? 
uh, uprisings do not mean taking an anti-Western and, to be specific, an, an anti-American stand. Uh, revolutionaries want reform at home. They want to improve the quality of governance. Uh, and uh, let me be clear about it. An uprising does not mean immediate transition to democracy. The transition to democracy is a protracted process that may take, uh, that, that may take decades, if, if not more. So let's not have delusions and illusions about an immediate transition to democracy. Uh, let's take oil, for example. The Libyans, whether under Qaddafi or anybody else, they will be selling oil. I don't understand, I don't believe that any Arab country wants to be on bad terms with the US. Maybe they want to improve the quality of relationship with the West. So it, the question is not uh, uh, who will win, who will gain out from this uprising. Uh, what, what I have here is that the people are fed up with the regimes, the, the people are demanding change. Uh, now, uh, the, 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 uh, the guest from Washington said that People are talking about dignity and said this is a CIA. Uh, he, he referred this to, to the Carter years. Yes, I mean, if you live in many Arab uh, countries, you know, if you live under brutal regimes, if you live under dictatorships who violate the population, then dignity becomes a salient matter and people there do not really need to get such definitions from a Western type dictionary. So what we have at stake right here is a massive movement for change. People want change. Change does not mean uh, eroding relations with the West. Actually, I do. I, I am of the opinion that transition in the Arab world, the empowerment of the people to the extent the West and the military establishments are willing to calibrate it, that will reflect positively on Arab-American and Arab-Western relations. All right, now, we have to take a break. Well, when we come back, a lot of questions still. What's at stake? What is to come out of all of this? Freedom, democracy, autocracy, what, change or continuity? And of course, Washington's role in all of this is the world witness to a post-American world and what would Arabs do in a post-American world? Stay with us. We're back with the link discussing three months of ongoing revolutions in the Arab world. Thousands killed, thousands injured, Two dictators deposed, others grasping at every single bayonet to survive. But then again, change or continuity and what's to come out of this, and of course, Washington's role in all of this. For that and more, we're joined from London by Gamal Gamati, leading writer, political commentator from Washington by Webster Griffin, Turpley, author, journalist, and lecturer from Philadelphia, Daniel Pipes, founder and director of the Middle East Forum, from Beirut by Halal Khoshan, professor at American University of Beirut, and of course, our panels of audience in London and Beirut. But I'd like to start this time around with Philadelphia. Daniel Pipes, you heard... Um, you heard them all. And now the question, international reaction to all of this? We talked about the CIA, so on and so forth. But there is another thing people are talking about. Thierry Zakaria's book, Post-American World, is the thing that's happening in Libya. Americans counting their pennies back home, saying we can't even afford it. A sign of times to come, a post-American world. America simply one of the players, not the major superpower, the sole superpower of the world. Great question. But before I get to it, could I just comment on the discussions taking place? Go ahead. I've written two books on conspiracy theories. And so this is a subject that interests me. And I've seen the Middle East uh, traditionally as the most conspiracy-minded part of the world. And so I'm delighted to watch as Middle Easterners say no to an American conspiracy theorist who says this is all made in Washington. They're saying, no, it's not made in Washington. We're doing it. I'm delighted by that. I think it's very healthy. I think it's a sign of uh, a real change that's underway. And part of the reason why I'm, uh, I've got more optimism about the region than I had just three, four months ago. Uh, as to your question, is this a post-American world? I th well, uh, there certainly is going to be less money available for a foreign policy, uh, especially for military purposes. But at the same time, I think what you're seeing now has less to do with money and more to do with the nature of the current administration, the Obama administration, and particularly a, uh, a figure in it named Samantha Powers has a very different approach from the, say, uh, traditional approach of either Bush's or Clinton or uh, predecessors. And so uh, this is less post-American, post I think, than an experiment an experiment in having the United States be just one of the, the, the governments 
not be the leader, but be just one of the guys. I call it the United States pretending to be Belgium. We'll, we'll see. Is this going to work? Is it not going to work? But it's definitely a, an experiment, and I suspect it's not a very long-lasting experiment. I don't think we've entered into a post-American world. Now, let's go to Washington. Webster Tarpley. Uh, when we talk these, about these dictators in the Arab world, we're talking people who have been in power for the past three, four decades. And that goes as far back as uh, the Nixon uh, administration back in this stage. And then there is one point that all of these also share, and that is support coming from the U.S. Well, at times, support has been coming from elsewhere, like Libya, for example, at some point receiving its support from Russia. But uh, then again, many of these monarchs, dictators, kings, whatever the name, they've been receiving support, all kinds of support from Washington. Now, all of a sudden, we hear Washington saying things like, all right, even uh, President Saleh, it's perhaps time to go. So how do you see this? And if you say Washington has been arranging for this to happen, why all of a sudden going from supporting the dictators to saying, uh, maybe, no, the people? I think it's, uh, it's a question of a crisis of the, of the Anglo-American empire, uh, to be sure. These authoritarian figures, some of them dictators that you're talking about, have been supported by the United States in the past, but today they are being dumped, and this is, this is quite obvious, and whether Obama endorses it or whether he hangs back means very little. It's what's being done covertly uh, on the ground, right? The C CIA, of course, has a $40 billion budget as a neocon, like Professor Pipes certainly knows. Uh, the question, the crisis of the empire takes the following form. Under the U.S. empire, there is no economic development. There's only IMF conditionality, uh, deregulation, privatization, the race to the bottom, and so forth. These countries rightly want economic development. Now, in order to get economic development, in order to have autonomy and the dignity that comes from, from national independence, they've got to go to either Russia or China, or some of them go to Iran, or some of them, like Turkey, attempt to build themselves up uh, through various alliances. we just take an example or two. Uh, who's playing the Russian card in the, uh, in the Middle East? Well, Gaddafi had, had or invited in the Russians to build a railroad along the coast and to provide some, some air defense, which would prevent the Libyan people from being bombed by, by NATO predator drones today. There was a group in Saudi Arabia around Prince Bandar that was interested in playing the Russian card in order to balance the overweening presence of the United States, the complete subjugation. In the case of uh, the China card, that's basically everybody in Africa. Uh, Gaddafi had 40,000 Chinese workers in Libya doing a lot of the oil work, which the Anglo-Americans do not want. Algeria today has about 40,000 Chinese workers, and they're building uh, all sorts of things. The big one, of course, is Pakistan massively playing the Chinese card. And we may be very close to some very ugly developments between the United States and Pakistan, even as we speak. Uh, Mubarak, as I say, was attempting to, to open up a dialogue with Iran uh, instead of having the the, the Egypt and Iran uh, constantly at loggerheads, he wanted to find some kind of a constructive solution. The general idea I think you can see is in Ivory Coast, because we not only had 175 of the UN Security Council, we, uh, we had 173, and then we had 175 on the Ivory Coast. And you can see today a massacre of supporters of uh, former President Gbagbo in Ivory Coast under the aegis of the United Nations with the UN, UN Far from, from avoiding a massacre, they're actually taking part in the massacre of black Africans under this responsibility to protect, which has come up uh, at least indirectly in the discussion. That responsibility to protect doctrine under humanitarian cover is a way to intervene in the internal affairs of basically every state on this All planet. Right, now, there now, are no more independent states. And it violates the UN Charter, which says that interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states is ruled out. All right. Now, let's go to our panel of audience in Beirut. Now, the question is, for quite some time, for decades, it was Washington that stood behind many of the monarchs, many of the kings, many of the people who are right now perhaps shivering and trembling in their uh, palaces in the Middle East, in the Arab world. Now, the question is, the very same Washington is right now changing tone, um, calling these guys, maybe it's time to go. Let me ask you about what you think on this flip-flop coming from Washington. 
Uh, actually, at the beginning, I would like to clarify a point. If we are going to discuss the Arab revolutions or what is going on uh, as youth movements or the society movements in the Arab world, out of a panoramic view, we have to state a very important point that each revolution taking place in each Arab country is totally different from the other. There is a specificity that we have to respect and to deal with in order to be able to analyze what is going on 